Yeah, sure. Uh, as long as it's not, you know, too late in the afternoon here, but I think it'll be okay. But so is it noon there? Yes, it's uh, twelve oh three p.m. here. Okay. Three hours later than the West Coast. Or three hours earlier. You could say it that way, I guess. Or you, you, you <laughs> your day started three hours earlier. Let's put it that way. Oh, so Greg, yeah. last last we heard from your email, you were in the throes of a super major house <laughs> remodeling, renovation, oh, repair, yeah. and all, oh, of yeah. that, all of the above. So, how yeah. is everything okay now, or how okay, now? Well, it's almost finished. The the flooring's all done in the the stairways, the hallway, the bedroom, the flooring's done. The the hardwood floors. They'll do it here in the den. So that's why you still got you still see junk piled behind me. And I got crap sitting out sitting outside. I'm taking out all the all the loose junk, and it's all wrapped in plastic sitting out in the patio next to the pool. So that it because it's been you know off and on sprinkling or whatever it is, but it's all off the ground. And um. You can't believe how much trash we had accumulated. Just stuff that we just never got around to throwing out. Marsha has, God love her, Marsha has a great habit of taking every bill. She wants to hang on to every bill since the day we were married. Why, I don't know. Even the tax guy says, grind them up. After seven years, grind them up. Don't worry about it. Right. And so it's bad enough that she hangs on to the invoice, but she also hangs on to the envelope that the invoice came in. <laughs> and all the advertising crap that's crammed in there with you trying to get you to buy something else and oh boy as we were going through this stuff i'd pick it up i'd pull out the invoice and i'd throw the rest of the trash he goes we might we might need that address i said you don't need that address for 30 years you don't need that you know it's like hanging onto envelopes for people if you don't get around to put them in your address book you'll never get around to doing it so i set them on top of the computer and that means you got to put them right away before you throw them in the garbage you know kind of a thing but Look at everybody can find everybody if they put any real effort into it. Let's face it. So, so, so um, we, ended, we ended up you so last I'm not so much with, uh, Greg. I'm interested in hearing if you are able to eliminate at least some of the aluminum wiring in favor of copper as you redid the wiring part. Or, oh no 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 we but, no, we, that was not, the, no no we ended up. Uh, it started out that the. Uh, in the master bedroom, the shower, for whatever reason, the, uh, the, uh, there's three full baths in this house. Um, the, there's a full bathtub shower combo in the second bathroom upstairs. In the master bathroom upstairs, it has a commode room with the toilet and a, a double shower. And then outside that, uh, a full, a sunken bathtub, which in 24 years of living here, we've never used that. Because we have a hot tub in the backyard. We'd rather use the hot tub. Uh, you got flashed the neighbors occasionally, but other than that. And then um, then downstairs, downstairs off the den, there is another full shower. No bathtub in this one, but a double shower in this one with a door that goes to the outside. That way, if people were using the pool, they could use that bathroom and out and traips water through the den. Yeah, and they could, wa they could wash off, you know, the chlorine and all that kind of baloney, which is really nice. Yeah. Well, every bathroom except the master bathroom was tile on the on the shower in the master bathroom it was a fiberglass shower oh. talk about cheap and twice we've had the pan the shower pan uh it cracked and started leaking luckily it didn't do any damage and so this time marcia said this is dumb why don't we just replace we've always been talking about 25 years have been talking about re redoing the bathroom so we decided let's do a oh, fine we'll have them take this out we'll have them put a real seat in there so that i can sit down because i had to use a temporary seat you know when I take my leg off and leave it outside so that I, I have a handicap seat. I had bars in there. So we had a guy come over and we bought the tile. We had a guy come over. He built the seat in there. He had to get one of those square rain heads and then the separate shower wand. And we had that. We decided to have a different door put on. So it's half inch thick glass swinging door. That's beautiful. But now that needed heavier duty hinges. Uh, the, the bedroom like two other rooms in this house was wallpapered by the previous owners. And in the bedroom, the master bedroom's about 18 by 20, it's huge. It has two levels, so you have to walk up a level. It, this house has three full fireplaces, two wet bars, in it, which we don't drink, so that's really practical. It's just more <laughs> junk storage, that's all. 
the um, upstairs in the uh, dressing room, er the dressing area, and in the commode, not only were the walls wallpapered, but the ceiling was wallpapered. And when they put the wallpaper up, I guess they found out that the whatever wallpaper they had at the time didn't stick too well. So they used sprig or they used a uh, roll on glue. So now when they go to take the wallpaper off, it took the wall board covering off. Now paint won't stick. So now we had to have somebody come in and put a plaster coating or whatever they call it over all the wall board in the entire bedroom. Oh. And then that had to be painted. And um, so that was fun. Was, the that easier than, was that easier than replacing the wall board to have? Oh. Them oh, yeah, definitely. Definitely cheaper. It was about a grand to have that, about that, a grand to have that done. And wow. then the, um, of course, the, the, the registers for the vents for the air conditioning and stuff, those were all wallpapered, as well as all the electrical switches and boxes and stuff. Those were all wallpapered. So those all had, including the socket. They actually put wallpaper on the actual face of the socket and just cut the holes out for where the plugs would go in. Yeah, I've Talk seen people do that. I don't know. I've got mixed feelings about it. But. So, of course, when you go to replace the wall sockets, because the house is aluminum wiring, you're supposed to use a special heavy-duty type plug that accommodates the aluminum wiring. So we had to buy those plugs to do that. I've done that once before on some of them, but I, I never bothered to replace the ones that were behind furniture because I figured, hey, nobody ever see them. Why worry about it? You know. Well, now they're all in the open, so I had to replace all those. And then um, the, the carpet had been damaged so badly by the dogs, and we had just gotten to the point where we didn't care anymore that the the uh, in, the flooring installers wouldn't touch the carpet because it was so filthy. So we had to hire a, gu a guy to come out to tear the carpet out and get rid of that. There was another guy there for doing that. Then let's see. So the bedroom's done. The, the, the blinds come in sometime this week. They've already measured them. They're being made right now. So the new blinds for the bathroom come in this week. The um, and then we'll get the rest. Then we'll get the furniture. You know, now we got to put decorations up on the wall because you had color on the wall before. Everything's white, including white furniture, so it really blends in well. And then, then the the stairway is now uh, hard hardwood. That takes that's a little more effort for me to go up and down the stairs. And so we're going to eventually have another banister put in so that I can. I'll leave a cane downstairs and a cane upstairs for emergencies, clamped on to the you know standing nearby or whatever so that I can use both hands to pull myself up the stairways. Right now I'm using the cane as the second support. But so far I've been okay. I'm surprised I haven't slipped on the floor of wood. I was always a little afraid about that. They, you know, the first thing they said is, well, you know, we can put that plastic runner stuff. You know, that's sort of like having the plastic covers over your furniture. It just makes everything look cheap when you do that, I think. So, so the floor looks great. The flooring looks great. So they've still got to do the flooring here in the den. That'll be probably a week after next because of our scheduling issue. And then Monday, the guy comes out to, to do all the trim and the doors in the bedroom. There's five doors in the bedroom, double doors to get in, double doors to the closet, door to the commode. Those got to be painted, but we're, we're doing them a different color. And um, let's see, what else? And then they have to do, once they get the flooring done down here, we have to have new, new blinds put in down here. So this $10,000 project, we're hovering right around 50 right now. Yeah. Uh, did oh, you ever, he's coming up and she goes, well, do you want to redo the kitchen? No, not this year. <coughs> that's it. Run, we've run out of here. That's it. We're not spending any more money on remodels this year because I don't want to finance anything. I only want to pay cash for everything. So we okay. figured out stocks that weren't doing well for us that we weren't going to, you know, gain anything on and we can't, can't. And then, of course, she turned 71 and a half and you have to start using some of the IRA money. So that work, we, we timed that just right. Dumb luck, you know, but uh, before you know it, we're probably under the IRA money for the next couple of years if, I, right. if I'm not real careful. Here, so want to get it, kind of stretch it out a little bit where it's not too ridiculous. So go ahead. Yeah. Did you ever see the movie, The Money Pit? Oh, sure. Oh, yeah. Tom Hanks yeah, and Tom Hanks and Shelley Long. Yeah. 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 That's, yeah. What, that's what this sounds like. Yeah. And one other comment regarding the ceiling in the bedroom. Yeah, it could have been worse. It could have been mirrors. <laughs> now, wait a minute. Inside, inside the uh, dressing area, double sink. This house has two of the bathrooms have double sink, and uh, both those bathrooms had a mirror. The one bath, the one bathroom, 
uh, in the master bedroom, the mirror was a nine foot by four and a half foot mirror. And one day, one day, Marsha's upstairs doing something in the bedroom or whatever, and it was really hot out and we didn't have, we don't ever run the air conditioner. And for whatever reason, the mirror just fell off the wall. <laughs> and broke into a million, luckily she wasn't there, she wasn't in that area at the time. But when I looked around to have them, nobody makes those anymore. When I looked around to have a mirror made to replace it, it was going to be like $700 because it's a custom one piece mirror and then another $150 or $200 to have somebody come up and install it. And it never dawned on me. I mean, immediately I went to the other bathrooms that had a full size mirror, but not near as big and put extra anchors on the damn thing. This one just had the mastic on the back and the, it just gave up after 25 years, you know. And so last week we went to Ikea. Hey, one of the few things that we've done that was smart and bought two $20 mirrors. We're going to put a smaller mirror over each sink and then put some kind of another cabinet or whatever in between the sinks. So she's got more crap storage up there. And so unbelievable. Greg, yeah. I, I one time had the same thing happen on a car. My, <clears throat> I had a, I forgot what year Cadillac it was. And, uh, the uh, right-hand mirror one day just fell off and shattered, of course. I've, seen, I've had that happen before. Yeah, the so I had, a, I had to go to Cadillac, and it took three weeks to get the replacement. So I put the replacement uh, mirror on, and as I'm going to, you know, match the thing up, it dropped out of my hand. The replacement mirror <laughs> broke. Oh. So I had to wait another two weeks <laughs> to finally get a mirror for it. Well, you know, on modern modern automobiles, most of them have uh, the rear view mirror glued onto the windshield with a special adhesive. Right, right. And, <laughs> but even though it's meant for the purpose and it's very strong, it's not perfect. And we had a Chrysler minivan before we got our current cars. Back when we were still living in Anaheim, we had this 97 Chrysler minivan. Gave us many long years of good service. Like, I don't know, between 10 and 15 years, I think we had that thing. We bought it brand new. It had a rear view mirror that was, like most, glued on the glass. But it also had wires attached uh because it was the kind you know that has the control for uh adjusting depending on the lighting conditions day or night and i think it adjusted if you know if there were headlights right it, it did the, or it, headlights from the rear right. it would you know they used to have oh, a the daylight mirror, mirror. right yeah. right so because of those features it had to have this small <laughs> electrical cable leading away from it and it went up into the headliner, you know. Well, that thing came off not once, but twice during that 10 or 15 year span. And both times I, I we went out in, in you know, hot California sun with the car closed up. We parked in the driveway in those days. We, didn't, we had a garage, but we didn't use it for cars. And, you know, it just from all the heat or whatever, it just let loose. The adhesive failed, and there it was dangling by the wires. So at least the wires stopped it from falling. But Yeah. But, uh, and I was able to go, you go to an auto parts store, and you, you look around or you ask at the counter for the rearview mirror adhesive, and they have a special adhesive, and it tells you how to prep the surfaces on the mirror and the glass how to mark it, you know, you put the mirror up there, mark it with like, I used, I think I used a, a, a Sharpie pen or something to go around it to mark the outline of exactly where you want it. And then you put the glue on the glass and on the mirror, and then you stick the two together and you have to hold it for like 30 seconds or a minute or something. And then that thing is permanent and that maybe takes a little longer for it to cure fully, but basically it's on there. It's a type of, it's similar to super glue, alpha cyanoacrylate type glue, I think. And then if you can still see the line from the Sharpie, you wait till the thing is really well cured and then you can clean it off a little bit so it's not visible. I had to go through that at least twice on that car. <laughs> okay. Well, it's fun. It really is fun. I mean, it's something that we've wanted. It's just like the kitchen. We repainted the kitchen the second or third year we were here. But the cabinets are the old style cabinets. There's, There's a lot, a lot of, of lot of red brick inside this house that 
I don't necessarily want to take it out, but I'd sure like to cover it up or paint it white or do something with it. So, well, does anybody have any? Because I wasn't planning on on doing the talk till right around ten. So, do we have any yeah, issues yeah. That we want to talk about? Anybody got any Mac issues of any sort, or iPhone or iPad issues? Have you heard anything about the new um, monitor and uh, the Pro Mac coming out at all? Have you anybody no. heard anything? No, that, I haven't seen much. I mean, I I follow Renee Ritchie, who is one of the he's from iBoard.com, and he has a he has his own he does two or three um, things a week. On Tuesdays, he does the Mac Break Weekly with Leo Laporte and uh, um, Andy and Otko and Renee, and occasionally they get, uh, oh, shoot, I can't even think of his name now, the, uh, the guy from Pixel Core. Um, but uh, and sometimes they'll talk about any rumors or whatever. There's a lot of rumors coming around, and hopefully they're going to do, so, they're going to talk about, um, you know, worldwide developers uh, conference is only a month away in June. Yeah. So hopefully they'll they'll show some new stuff there. I wouldn't mind upgrading my Mac. This is a 2012. I wouldn't mind upgrading Marshall's is the same year. But mine will get first shot at it. But right now, quite honestly, they haven't um, they haven't been uh, there hasn't been enough changes in the in the laptops in the last seven years yeah. to make it worthwhile for me since yeah. I don't use it to make money with anymore. You know, I mean, it was a different story when when I could at least write it off. I can't even do that anymore because I don't want to. I don't want to go out and work on customers' computers anymore. I don't want to do any of that crap anymore. So I'll help people over the phone, but that's pretty much about it. Hey, uh, there have been rumors about, the, about an update to the uh, Mac Pro line, to the tower. Yeah, they've been talking about that it now has, for the last year, year and a half, something like that. Yeah, that hasn't been updated in a rather long time, so it's kind of overdue. But. And, there's, and there's even rumors about a um, modular MacBook coming out. Mm -hmm. uh, where you'll be able to, there it, it might be like. Remember at one one time they had a power book that had a uh, disk drive that had a floppy drive that could pop out and you could put in a uh, a CD ROM drive or whatever it is. So if you if you knew we were going somewhere where you needed access for more storage or more battery or whatever it is, there's some talk that they might have something like that, but that's all speculation. But I know that they're supposedly working on a new keyboard because this butterfly style keyboard that they've had had. Some people have liked it, and a lot of people have bitched about the keys failing and stuff like that. Apple's got a pretty good policy about taking care of it, but they've pissed a lot of people off with that keyboard. Same thing with the touch bar. A lot of people hate the touch bar. I think the touch bar should have been in addition to, or it should have been an, an option. I like the idea behind it, but I didn't like the idea of permanently losing function keys. You only get function keys when it thinks you need function keys. Well, yeah, That's the thing I couldn't understand. The thing that bothered me about the soft keys, it's great that they're programmable because you can get more functions and they can be tailored to the app or area you're in. But, you know, one key in the upper left corner that really needs to be in hardware escape. is the escape key. Escape, yep. Because escape if that's key. That's programmable and something goes wrong, you can't hit command option escape and expect to get, you know, back. You, expect to get the window where you can kill an errant app you know but. so i'm kind of hoping that we'll see a new macbook now here's a here is a rumor that i've heard now i've read from two or three different places that apple's you know, on this kick to get as, as small a bezel as possible everything so they're they pissed a lot of people off when they dropped the 17 inch laptop which a lot of the manufacturers dropped the 17 inch laptop because there just wasn't enough demand for it right but supposedly one of the rumors right now is they're going to leave the 15 inch laptop in its place but they're going to manage to put a 16 inch excuse me uh, effectively a 16 inch screen in a 15 inch laptop it'll run almost all the way to the very edge so that would be a nice compromise to give you one extra you know one extra inch of uh, diagonal space yeah. a bigger screen basically in the same size package that would be a really nice touch they probably ticked off every single uh, uh every single tv and screen hello finger was number 2 in national hey let's get you go ahead who's ever talking about right? greg greg who's i thought Denver had the second best record behind the warriors so who's talking about Denver and the Warriors? 
please mute your screen. Whatever. Hang on, um, I'm gonna mute everybody. Okay, Greg. Yeah, now you need you need to unmute your you need to mute your, unmute yourself, uh, Bruce, if you haven't done it. Got it, Bruce. I got it. Whoops, you just you just turned it back on. Hang on. My eyes get to the point I can't read this crap anymore. <laughs> All right, I think I'm unmuted now. No, you're unmuted, you're good. Okay, I was so just gonna if add you need that. To talk, if you need to talk, unmute yourself. Okay. Because if need be, I'm gonna mute people just so that we only have one one or two people talking at a time, not somebody on the phone talking about something else. Oh. Uh, I was just gonna add that when they dropped the 17 inch Mac portables, the MacBook Pros, they probably pissed off about every uh, TV and screen editor in Hollywood because those guys, I guess, love to sit on the beach with their big 17-inch MacBook Pro and edit a movie or something and pull in the big bucks, you know. But Well, now they don't have – they can still do that, but they have to do it on a smaller screen. And as right. you know, for video editing, even 17 isn't all that big, really. But you know, No, you can, but, at, you know, at least there's – I mean, I use this program all the time. I don't have it on. I don't have it with me right now. But I take an iP – I've got a, a iPad Pro. i got a – you know, what is it, a 12 inch, and then I've got the the seven inch or seven and a half. I got the 10 inch iPad Pro and the seven and a half inch um, iPad. And you know, for twenty dollars, you can get a program called uh, Duet, and uh, that's twenty dollars for the Mac version, and then the iPad, iPhone versions are free. And then on theirs, you use a physical cable. So the good thing is, you can plug into your USB port or your expansion port or whatever it is. And so that you're always powered up and it becomes either a mirrored screen or an extended desktop screen. So if you've already got an iPad, there's a great way of getting more use out of it. Because when I got the iPad Pro, I thought, what am I going to do with the seven and a half inch iPad? Well, it just became a regular thing to leave down here. So when I'm working in, when it was Photoshop, now I'm working in Affinity and, and pu same with Publisher or any of the programs that have got the floating palette. Man, that works so slick to just drag all those tool palettes over onto that second screen and give me back almost the entire screen here with uh, workable space, yeah. which, you know, you, Janine's got the great big screen. I think you've got two big screens, don't you, Janine? No, you're muted still. Gotcha. You're, you're muted now. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, I still have my big cinema display, uh, mm -hmm. which is not in good shape, but I'm going to, I'm really looking forward to, when Apple is going to come out with this brand new, hopefully big monitor, then I'll have two. There you go. And you, you all saw here two week, two months ago when when we were over at Bart's house and we were doing the, uh, he was showing how he was using his old iMac as a secondary screen when he's not using it as an iMac. And yeah. so that worked out really slick from that standpoint. I thought, Bart, that was a, a great use of that resource because you wouldn't get squat for it if you tried to sell it, let's face it. It's worth much more as a monitor than anything else. Yeah, and then you got a computer too, which is really good. So there's nothing wrong with that idea. Yeah, the top uh, resale value uh, on it was uh, only three hundred and fifty dollars, and that was the top uh, value on the thing. Yeah, and that's a twenty-seven inch, so you couldn't even get a regular monitor for the three hundred bucks. So, oh heck, no! Uh, not only couldn't I get a regular monitor for three hundred bucks. Remember, I need uh, monitors that I can calibrate, uh, right? So that uh, I, uh, you know, the uh, color is uh, correct, and more so now that uh, I I bit the bullet last month. Uh, um, B and H Photo sent me an offer to buy a, uh, uh, a set. Was it seven color or eight color? Um, a professional uh, printer after the rebates and everything cost me seventy nine dollars. <laughs> and of course, and it's of course the paper, the paper and the inks by are going to bankrupt this household. <laughs> yeah, that, you didn't tell him that's a thirteen by nineteen printer, so he could do full uh, 
full page uh, booklets and even trim and even trim the borders off and you can still get an 11 by 17 booklet out of the 13 by 19. Yeah, I, uh, I, I've, uh, in fact, for this uh, project I have uh, for uh, school, uh, I've been, uh, I printed everything up uh, in 13 by 19. And um, plus I have some other ones that I did on the uh, uh, drum uh, printer that uh, are um, uh, 48 inch wide. So I'm jealous. <laughs> Greg, Greg, I remember when App, a few years back when Apple dropped the 17-inch size MacBook Pros, that you were one of the people that were kind of complaining because you didn't know what you were going to do when it was time to replace your 17-inch. You know, you were thinking about, well, should I get the latest 17 that's later than mine and brand new, but not the but it's not the latest Mac model, or should I get the latest Mac model in a smaller screen size? I think you ended up with a 15 inch. I did. Screen. And I bought, I bought the, the next to the top of the line. I mean, I didn't, I went for the um, 500 gig solid state drive and I went for the, it's the, I, I mean, I bought a refurb one from Apple. And the good thing about the refurb one, especially if they're limited supply is, I didn't buy it with the i7. I think it had the i5 chip in it at the time because the price difference was like $400. Mm -hmm. And the good, but I did get it with 16 gigs of RAM because I knew that it wasn't something I could change out myself. Mm -hmm. And um, when I ordered it, Apple has a real interesting, from at least Apple does, or they did then, they had a real interesting feature. If the one you ordered isn't available, they'll give you the next better one for the same price. That's you know, yeah. unless it's a ridiculous price difference. If it's three or four hundred dollars, they just want to turn the inventory. Yeah. So, so the trick, the trick is, yep. The trick is to, so the trick is to wait around and try to second guess when that's going to happen, and then yep. buy in hopes that you'll get lucky. And if you don't so get like lucky, they, you don't, you're no worse off, really. Yeah. So like if they show if they show some new Max, let's say Worldwide Developers Conference, that'd be a good good time to show it. If they show a couple of new models, then. Then about the November, December time frame, or even January, would be a good time to see if there's any refurbs of the brand new models out. Right. Hey, just uh, to show you what these, uh, what the thing can print. This oh, is, nice. This is wow, a, look at that. Uh, uh, 14 by, uh, I mean a... Uh, 13, 13 by 19? Uh, print. Can you turn that light on? Yeah. Mark, that looks good, even over this video hookup here. I can how, much, how much are the inks for that? Uh, if you bought the whole set of inks, it's like uh, $130. But in actuality, the inks don't uh, get used up at the same rate. Right. I have uh, a warning on it. So uh, I've got this uh, supposed to come uh, uh, today or Monday. Uh, I had yeah. to order, order. Uh, the uh, light magenta ink for it, uh, but uh, it looks, it looks like, like what's going to happen is instead of having to plunk out for a whole set of inks. The one nice thing about this Canon printer is that uh, in normally, you know, when you buy a printer, they give you enough ink to print two or three test prints. Mm -hmm. Four, five, four, three, two. Canon, uh, they uh, give you uh, a full set of uh, inks where uh, it's not only the full set that you'd buy for the 130 bucks, but they give you a little extra ink in each cartridge so that uh, you can use that ink to run your setup, um, uh, initial setup on the uh, printer. Bart, is that an inkjet printer or is it a dye sublimation printer or what? It's inkjet. It's, it is inkjet, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is the paper expensive? Uh, well, uh, but as part of the deal, they gave me a, a 50 sheet uh, package of uh, uh, 13 by 19 uh, paper. But uh, that package of paper is about uh, 50 bucks when you go to buy it. But yes, the some of the papers can get very expensive uh, if you're printing yourself. If you're going to an art paper, you can pay uh, as uh, some of the papers are up 120, 130 for a 10 sheet pack. Ooh. Yeah, it. Uh, yeah, that, 
looked like it was a 13 by 19 glossy. Is that what that was? Uh, th this no, I had, this is uh, what's uh, called a um, uh, not pebble tone, a um, satin. Uh, it will come to me. But what you're seeing, the gloss you're seeing, is that uh, I have the pictures in. Um, oh, you got them in a plastic uh, sleeve. I see it now. I've got it for protection. Right for, for your portfolio. I've got it and you can see the. Um, well, I guess that it's pretty reflective without the uh, uh, sleeve on it too. But um, yeah, the the sleeves are uh, uh, the pretty inexpensive. I think I paid for twenty five of them, about seven bucks, and that's uh, yeah, that's because they keep one, fingerprint stuff. The one problem with inkjet printing is, I mean, if everything is optimized, the paper and the uh, the ink and the the color matching and everything, uh, it's still not w very water resistant. You know, you have to keep it dry. So, it depends. like that is probably one good way to do that. You know, it depends on what kind of paper you use. Oh, really? Uh, there's there's two kinds of paper, and uh, that's uh, true for um, uh, chemical uh, printing uh, too. You know, for your old style you know, shooting with an enlarger. Uh, there are uh, uh, papers where the dye is, I mean, where, well, yeah, in a thing like this, where uh, everything is actually physically inside uh, uh, the paper. In uh, black and white photography, it's literally uh, uh, on an art paper, uh, it's, um, the emulsion is literally soaked into the paper itself, and then they also make uh, the, uh, there's the something type where it's on the surface. Well, are they are they, are they clay coated? What are they clay coated? Uh, no, I, uh, are which ones clay coated? The more expensive papers. I'm just wondering uh, about Bruce's, Bruce's comment about needing to keep it dry. I under, yeah, I agree with that. I just wondered, you know, that the a lot of the magazines, uh, the slick magazines, those pages are coated with clay. And I wondered if that was possible with a, a high-end printer like that. I don't know. Um, the uh, I know that they make a spray uh, that you can... Uh, uh, put on to uh, protect us. Right, and that, that's pr and that has UV co covering and all kinds of stuff in the spray. Yeah, I, I've used the sprays before. There's a ma there's matte finish spray, and there's glossy sprays or whatever. You know, you take them out, set them on a couple of sheets of newspaper on a picnic table outdoors because you don't want, otherwise it smells kind of strong. And you give it a, a quick. Sh I, it's amazing how phenomenal it looks when you put that spray coating over. And now you've effectively sealed everything inside there, so it's pretty resistant for moisture and stuff like that then. Well, what is the compound that uh, that the spray is composed of? Uh, it's, composed of, of <laughs> it's composed of a compound that comes spraying out of the muscle. <laughs> uh, yeah. it's, it's, it's some kind of a variation of lacquer. Okay. All right. I know I've it doesn't never, I've never it used it stuff I use made by... Um, I want to say it's Mizell, which is a company that makes all kinds of, of uh, retouching materials and stuff like that. And you can put that clear coat spray on it, and it, you had to, you literally had to use like paint thinner if you wanted to get it off, mm. and uh, and which you wouldn't do because you'd be wasting your time. But man, once it once it dried, um, shoot, you could you could roll the paper, you could do whatever you want to it. Nothing and nothing ever happened to it. It really really worked out well. So if you had to put it in a situation where people might be touching it, you yeah. know, just in, in a regular portfolio, the clear pages makes more sense for what he's doing. But if you had to put it somewhere where, where you wanted to get as much contrast as possible uh, for the glossy effect, because gloss is my personal favorite, that worked great. It was, a great. it was a great compromise to be able to pull that off. Did you get it at an art store? Yes. Okay. Like I said, I think the brand is Myzel, if I'm not mistaken, and they're really, but there's, I'm, I'm sure there's three or four different companies that, that that sell that kind of stuff, pencils for retouching, that kind of thing. No, the name does sound familiar. 
Okay. Anything else? Anybody else got anything we want to discuss or talk about or, or whatever? Uh, yeah. uh, yes. Yes. Has any has anyone ha here had any experience with replacing or upgrading solid state drives in a Mac, a MacBook Pro, for example? Um, well, I can tell you what we were going to do in this one, Bruce. We we changed uh, back when Steve was still with us about eight months ago or so. Marsha's drive, yeah, we came back from Alaska. Her internal hard drive on her laptop died. And um, luckily, I had taken a couple of four terabyte external conventional drives with me, but her, her internal um, platter based drive crapped out. So I went over to, um, I think she had a 256 gig drive. I went over and bought a half a terabyte solid state drive from uh, oh, Micro Center at the time. And I think it was 100 bucks at the time or whatever it is, not no housing. <laughs> And took it over, and Steve cracked, cracked hers open, cleaned it all out. We replaced the drive, went no problem. Unfortunately, then I bought a one terabyte drive to go inside this laptop, and I thought, well, I'll, I'll buy myself, you know, you can buy a case to be able to put, put your old drives in, you know, right. for like seven or eight dollars or whatever it is. So I bought a one terabyte drive to go inside this laptop. This particular model power Is that book, a solid state drive? It, it's oh. a solid state that's in there with a 500, terab a 500 gig. And I wanted to put a one terabyte in there just to have the extra space because I was carrying a couple extra drives with me anyway. Yeah. And I bought it. We we cracked this open and we started to put it in there. And Steve Steve's son caught it before we went any further. He said, uh, "Did you buy that drive from Apple?" And I said, "No, why?" And he goes, "You're not going to be able to put it in that model." For one or two years, Apple made their stupid proprietary horseshit. Excuse my language. Garbage. Uh, that required you to buy the drive from Apple. There are other companies make it now, but it's like double the price. And um, so well, you this, might want to check. You might want to check the model and see what your options are for that. Can good. I tell you? Uh, let me tell you the story of that. This was a week ago. Uh, you know, we have these what we call Clubhouse Saturdays yes. here at the Washington Apple Pie, the local Mac user group. <laughs> which is on off Saturdays when we're not having the general meeting uh, and not every Saturday, but you know, usually a couple of times a month on Saturday, we'll do this. Well, last Saturday, a guy brought in his, I think it was a 2015 MacBook Pro and had a solid state drive in it. All right. It was, a, um, I think it was a 250. He wanted to upgrade it to a 500 or 256 to 512, whatever, you know, all, all well and good. And he had gone to Micro Center and picked up a 500 uh, solid state drive with an adapter. It's a, just a little edge connector board and with a edge connector plug and an edge connector socket that goes between the new drive and the existing slot where the old drive comes out on the computer on the logic board, you know, on the main board. So, okay, fine, you know, I'll put it in, and it's very easy to do. The hardest part is taking off the rear cover just because there's eight or 10 screws, but once you do that, you take off the battery uh, connector, which just pries up carefully so that there's no power on anything. And then there's only one screw, it's a Torx T5, I think, on this one, on one end of the drive, it's a long, skinny drive, about like that. At one end, there's a T5 screw that screws it down to the board, the main logic board. The other end has this edge connector. Okay, so I take it out carefully, put the connector on the new drive, put the new board in, and screw it down, everything's fine. Goes back together, everything's fine. All right, so, and oh, and before we, uh, I think it was before we did that, while his old drive was still in there with his old operating system, he had al already upgraded to um, uh, Mo Mojave, the latest one, okay, on the internal solid state drive, the old one. So before we took that one out, we took, he had brought uh, a couple of external portable drives, USB type. One had his time machine, it, it, complete backup on it. The other one was a spare drive, which was good. So, okay, so I said, all right, we need to make this external one into a bootable drive, right? 
And one way I thought to do that was to run the uh, Mac OS installer, which I think does that, right? Does that been yeah. in your? Yeah. Yeah. It about has to. It about has to set up those hidden partitions and put the data into the recovery partition that needs to be in that partition in order for that to work, as well as installing the operating system in the main partition. So we did that. We ran, the, you know, we downloaded it. We're on a fast connection there. We downloaded it and installed it onto the external drive. Everything went well, just a plain vanilla Mojave installation. And then I made sure that it would boot from that drive, by, you know, holding the option key or, I don't know, I think I actually changed it in the system preferences startup drive. But anyway, it booted fine to this plain vanilla thing, you know, and uh, we ran the, you know, one went and installed it, it asked you the questions, you know, do you want to set up this and that, and your, uh, do you want to set up your Apple ID, blah, 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 and I skipped over most of that and put in, had him put in his existing login, his username and password that he used, up, used on the one. So everything's fine, okay. So then I said, well, you know, in order to finish the job, you know, we need to put your old stuff into the new drive, but it also has to be made bootable and everything. You can't just, you know, pulling it in with Time Machine alone wouldn't do the job. It might fill up that partition, but it wouldn't do the hidden partitions as far as I know and bless the thing and all that stuff. So, uh, so because of that, Pulling stuff in with Time Machine takes a long time. I tell them, well, we're not going to be able to do that today. We only have the, the whole thing is only four hours, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. So, uh, so what I did is I sent him home with instructions to go ahead and boot from the external drive and install the operating system again on the internal drive. And then once that's all set up and bootable, then all he has to do is run Time Machine on the internal drive pulling his files from that time machine back up and he's up and running everything's back where it was except now he's got the bigger drive in there sounds pretty good on paper right well i get an email later in the week that says that um when he ran the os installer on the internal drive he got an error message i forget what it said but it tr the you know, it's probably lost something in the translation from what he saw and what he wrote in the email, but it sounded awful lot to me like a kernel panic. Uh, so for some reason, the installer didn't finish properly on, running on the internal drive. It started okay, apparently. And here's the other thing, the drive, it must, I don't think the drive was totally bad from a hardware standpoint because I checked it in Unix uh, while we were booted from the external drive, I looked at the new internal drive before he left the club, you know, and I could see that, yeah, there was stuff there. We even, uh, I even uh, repart, what did I do? I changed the partition because they always, everything comes for Windows, right? The format and the partition scheme. So I repartitioned just to get the partition table changed from MBR to uh, GUP, GPT or GUID and everything, and that worked. And I could see the drive, and once I did that, it mounted on the desktop too. So we were booted from his external drive, and we could see this new drive with the main partition mounted on the desktop, and I could select it and do get info, and the storage capacity, the available capacity looked about right. Everything seemed okay. That doesn't sound like a hardware issue with the drive to me, does it? No. So yet he went home and had this problem. So I don't know. I, I don't think it's a hardware issue, except that I don't think it's somehow Mac compatible. So I wrote back and I said, look, was this thing, you bought it at Micro Center, but did they say it was Apple compatible or Mac compatible, or did you just pick it off the shelf along with the adapter and pay for it? And he, I think that's what he did. I don't think it was sold as a Mac compatible drive. So I don't know, I've never had that experience before, but it made me feel bad like I did something wrong, but I think it might've been the drive in the first place that was not suitable for a Mac or something. But. Well, like in our case, 
In what our case, system was being installed? Uh, what was that? What system was being installed on the computer? Uh, in all cases, uh, Mojave. Oh, okay. Well, Mojave. He was, he was already on Mojave on his old SSD in the Mac. So right, the, only, that was, the only thing we ever tried to install was Mojave, or the only thing he would have tried at home would have been Mojave, as far as I know. Oh, okay. Yeah, because now was it, were you using APFS or were you using HFS Plus? It was APFS because I think Mojave has to be anyway. No, it can, I, it can still it run can, on HFS, can, but there's you know, a I, to doing that. I wasn't sure about that, and I thought it was probably better. I think his internal drive, the original one, I think was APFS. So I thought, well, I don't know if it matters, but I better make the new one APFS. So when I, while I was booted from the external one, I ran disk utility to, par to change the partition map, like I just said a minute ago. And when I did that, I also made the internal main partition be an APFS partition, not HFS plus. Okay, be figuring, you know, that's probably, it may be needed, but it might not matter, and in any event, it should work. So I don't think that should have had anything to do with it, but it may have. Uh, I don't know. Well, well the, I the can't tell I have, you. In, in my, in our, sorry. Yeah, in our case, uh, Marsha's uh, MacBook Pro is maybe six or eight months older than mine, something like that. And... Um, Hers used an off-the-shelf SSD from Micro Center, no problem. Mine wouldn't accept it. Huh. Mine wouldn't accept it, and then it was Steve's son, Mark, who said, well, you know, Apple made, Apple made a series of MacBook Pros that you had to use an Apple certified or whatever disk solid-state drive in it to make it work, and I sure as hell. That is I got a hunch that this one price. was in that range of computers. Yep. I, yeah. and I, I think it shows it in Mac Tracker, but we just, why would you even think, you'd think solid state would be solid state? No big deal. You know, well, it wasn't. Well, well there's, there's two different types of SSD drives. You have your regular SSD that's a two and a half inch that's got the regular SATA connectors to it. And then you have the MVNE drive, which plugs into the motherboard. It's a whole right. different drive. Yeah. The problem is, is if you get a replacement MVNE drive and it's not an Apple drive, Apple did something really stupid for us, but for them, they changed the wiring configuration on that drive. <laughs> so a standard MVNE drive won't work in an Apple computer. Well, now, Frank, what do you know about this little edge connector adapter board? It's a very small board, about oh, half inch by one inch. You know, it's about the same width as a drive and very short, like half inch. And it goes between the drive edge connector and the edge connector socket on the board. Does that change that, the wiring or is that just to adapt to two different size connectors? Do you know? Well, MVME... Is a, it's a standard connection that all the drives will fit it. And Actually, I know I take that back. There are there. Are, I think there's like four different NVNE drives, and there could be more now. But it's the con the pin configuration on it. You have to look at the drive, and they've got notches on them, and certain ones designate certain things on the motherboard on how it's going to work. That, that's one of the problems between Apple. They just make it for their equipment, but PCs, they make it for theirs. So Apple does these little changes to make problems to use the drives. Hmm. Now, my oh, Hackintosh, I, I have, have an MVNE drive in it, but the maximum I can do is 550 gigabit transfer rate. Uh, well, well, megabit, hunch, megabit, Frank, excuse me, megabit. <laughs> I, I have a hunch that this computer probably falls within that range of Apple models where that was true. What you said was true about having to have an Apple drive, only I didn't know that, and he obviously didn't know that. And whoever he bought it from, I'm not sure if he actually dealt with a salesperson or just picked it off the shelf and walked out, you know, paid for it and walked out. But uh, 
it, it was he never really st stated clearly whether that was the case. He was planning to take it back for an exchange or refund, and I haven't had a chance to talk to him since then. So I don't know where it stands, but that's the first time I've had a, an experience quite like that uh, with one of these things. But the thing that per perplexes me is that the drive seemed to be working when it left because I could see it from the, op the external operating system in, in both disk utility and in terminal. And it also, after I reformatted it, to APFS, I, it, it mounted on the desktop, I could see it there. And I think I even made a short test file and stored it and then deleted it just to make sure I could read and write to it from the finder and all that stuff worked. And yet for some reason, the Mac installer, you know, hiccuped and barfed. If yeah. you will. But, so I don't know if it didn't like the drive or whether maybe it's some other unrelated thing. His machine was certainly capable of running Mojave. It wasn't too old because he had Mojave on it when he came in and it was running just fine. And in fact, I think I looked it up on, uh, not in Mac Tracker, not in the app, but on, uh, what's the one, everymac.com or something. Anyway, I think I looked it up and it was, Within, you know, it was new enough to accept Mojave, I'm sure. So, so right. I don't know what happened, but. Well, what I'm getting at is, is there are some slight differences. So, I, now, different. we're talking about partitioning an APFS drive. Actually, they don't partition. You may have one main partition. Now, if you, if you partition it for half HFS plus and half APFS, it will partition but you can't partition an APFS drive. What it does is it creates containers. Oh, uh, okay. Okay, in other words, I'm looking at mine right now for 1014, and it's, let's see, it's disk. Uh, okay, 1013, okay. Okay, it has, mine is disk, my EFI part, partition is disk 0S1. My 1013 drive is disk 0S2. Okay, and then the recovery is disk 0S3. Oh. Then it has disk 4, which is the Apple APFS portion. Hmm. And they call that a, a, actually a container. And hmm. that contains some more folders that they put certain things in, like your recovery disk and stuff like that. Because I went in and tried to part, I've got a terabyte drive that I installed in one of my Hackintoshes, and I wanted to, I have separate drives. I've got 1013 on one, and then I got 1014 on another. But that drive, I wanted to put 1013 and 1014 on. Well, 1014 is APFS, and I went in there to try to partition it, and the only thing it does is it puts a um, a uh, it puts a folder in there, but it's a folder with a with an arrow on it. What do they call that? The uh, uh, alias. Pardon me. Like an alias. Yeah, an alias. It's an alias folder, and I'm mean, just and there was no way for me to install 1013 on the other partition because it was full APFS. Okay, Frank, let me ask you something. Let me ask you this. If I were to have, when I partitioned that new drive, once it was in the machine, if I were to have set it up with the Apple partition map, you know, the uh, GPT, and all, and the partition or all the partitions as HFS plus, in other words, Mac OS extended journal, then, and no APS, APFS partitions, and then gone back and changed only one of those partitions, the main one, to APFS, would that have worked? Would that have solved the problem? Or would that have just done the same thing as what you're talking about? Well, I, I honestly couldn't answer that question. But in essence, since it's half HFS plus and half APFS, that drive is partitioned. But I couldn't partition it when I set up 1014. It wouldn't let me make a partition on it. That's what was funny. Oh, uh, 
Well, what like, what was the symptom? You were in disk utility, and you went to, <laughs> you went to the partition tab. Was something grayed out, or what happened? No, there was no way to partition it. In, uh, for me, when you, at least on me, and I was using ten fourteen. Well, when you say there was no way, what specifically do you mean? What did you see? Uh, well, when I went to partition it, all it did was create that alias folder uh, okay. in the container disk. Okay, so it, got, of the disk. so it appears to do something, but what it does is it just creates that alias thing. Correct. That, it, it puts an alias in there, correct. Okay, so the partition operation itself succeeds or appears to succeed. It just doesn't have the end result that you wanted. Right, like you would see in HFS Plus, the way it, you, can, you can make 10 partitions on it, no problem. APFS doesn't give you the ability to partition. Okay. Is, is what I have found. So, okay. you know, like I said, I have one disk that I'm basically running 1013 and 1014 on. One's, 1013 is running on APFS, or HFS Plus, and 1014 is running on APFS. But I, that's the way I originally set the drive up was half and half, half HFS plus and half APFS. Okay, so that's why I thought maybe if I mix them on purpose to try to trick it, if you will, into creating some HFS plus partitions that, you know, then it would work because it would only make an APFS partition where it needed it and the rest would stay uh, HFS plus and everything would work or something, but I don't know if that would have worked. Well, it's kind of academic now, but I kind of wondered what, if anything, I did wrong or if there was anything I could have done different or better to, you know, in case this happens again, and or, or if he's still having problems. I don't know what his current situation is. He is a member of the club, so, you know, I like to support people that are club members when I can so I don't know I'll find out you know eventually more about it whether he just gets a refund and then goes online and buys an apple uh, when it's apple compatible or what but we'll see so I just wonder if any of you guys had any experience with that but I think probably a lot of you don't care about this discussion anyway so why don't we uh, Greg, why don't we go on with the next big thing here. But. I have a quick question. What did the alias point to? It was just an empty folder. I couldn't okay. find it was on the drive itself. Okay, so and you now, couldn't find what it was pointing to. When that happened, I kind of gave up at the time and I haven't did any more on it okay. because of the fact I I didn't have time. I had other stuff I had to take care of. So and I haven't got back into trying that again. Now it's possible it could have worked, but I wasn't planning on screwing up my system. That took me so long to get up and running. <laughs> so. Well, if you solve it in the in the future, let us know, okay? Yeah, yeah, not a problem. I, you know, the, there's no doc. They Apple really hasn't released any documentation on the APFS. Okay. You know, uh, system. Well, not very much, anyway. Yeah. There is some on their developer side if you can wade through it, but I don't know if it's complete or not because no. I haven't, haven't waded through the whole thing. But. Right. It, it isn't complete, and that's, what, that's what's hindering some of the developers because there isn't enough published information on, on that. So a lot of people are eh, eh, on that. But, you know, I don't have what any about? Apple books. I don't have any Apple drives in any of my computers. They're all, you know, third-party drives. And I haven't had a problem with, with any of them in that respect. But I know that MVNE drives, there are problems with those if they're third-party. I don't remember the interface name. It, I think it was that or something similar to that, to be honest. I don't remember. The brand was um, Samsung, I believe, but that probably doesn't matter as much as that the interface is the right type, you know. But, um, now, one thing, I wonder, what about these companies, the third-party clone companies like Super Duper and Carbon Copy Cloner? How are they going to make cloning programs if Apple doesn't release enough details for them? 
Well, that, yeah, that's a good question. But at the same time, from what I understand, I know at least a uh, uh, carbon copy cloner, you can clone an APFS drive with their, from what I've heard. I have yeah, you can. It, you can. I've yeah. done it. So, you know, so, you know, most of my SSD drives are Samsung. In fact, I picked up a 500 gigabyte MVME drive. Now, since I'm running on a PC motherboard, there's two different types. The type I have takes two of my SATA ports to run that MVME drive on, on the motherboard that I have. Hmm. Now, that one I have to use two SATA ports. I can't but use those ports. But this is the PC right? For the PC motherboard. Right, right, right. Why, why does it take two? One for data and one for power? Or what's the reason well, for that? Well, there's the, the, the problem is, is the early drives, that's what they did. I have, I've got an earlier motherboard, not with, with I mean, it, it, I bought the, this motherboard's 2014, and it's running as a, as a 14.2 iMac is the, the type of system that I'm using to run on it. But my point was, is the newer ones on the newer motherboards don't use the SATA ports. What they do is they have, they're connected directly to the buses on the motherboard. Uh -huh. That's where you're getting your, your 2,500 and 3,000 megabit transfer rates uh -huh. is on the ones that are connected directly to the, the data paths on the motherboard, not using the SATA ports. Because it ha doesn't have to go through that conversion between the SATA interface and the bus wires. Right, right. The bus, the bus, uh, the, bus you know, the, the motherboard. Yeah, the bus is on the motherboard for the. Yeah, because the bus is. The bus. You, know the old saying, you know the old saying, the wheels on the bus go round and round. Ah, <laughs> yeah, because the bus is the fastest part that's not in, at least the part of the bits and pieces that are inside the processor, the CPU, it's the fastest external part on any computer, generally speaking. Right, it's the I, same I, bus well, that, good. It's the same bus that uh, the, the CPU is connected to, the memory is connected to, your, your um, uh, video card is connected to, they use those same, those are the main paths of, and sure. it's like, those main paths, the more you have, the more data you can run on it. That's right. why the video cards, they had a, an X, they had four paths, eight paths. Now they're up to the 16X, PCI 16X. There's 16 paths of data. So it, it increases the bandwidth for data. That's the more, more paths that you have, so. But anyway, um, I'm still, you know, I I know enough to get me in trouble sometimes on some of that stuff because there's so much of it out there. I, I, I Frank, I'm in the same boat, really. I mean, I sometimes know just enough to be dangerous. I think, but <laughs> and, and what surprised me is this guy who I didn't think had any. You know, he came in wanting somebody to help him put this drive in. Uh, he's been a long-time club member. I didn't know him. I didn't recognize him, but I, I know he's a member. Uh, but I didn't think he had any real, you know, knowledge or hardware expertise. Uh, and yet when he wrote back in one of his emails, he said he he had swapped the original drive back in himself. But, of course, he watched over my shoulder. He saw everything I did. I hope he used the right tool so he didn't strip out any of the screw heads or anything, you know, but, but he did, you know, it's pretty easy from a mechanical standpoint to do that particular job on that particular power book. Like I said, there's more case screws than there are things to do once you're inside there. So, um, you know, but talking about knowing enough to be dangerous, but he did put it back and I guess it's working like it was just fine so he's no worse off he's just got to figure out what to do with this new drive that didn't work in his computer you know so anyway i didn't want to take up so much time 